Jack Wise, and I'm here with Brandon Burks, and we are pastors at Westside Reformed Church. You can visit us at westsidereformed.org. And we are here today with a completely non-controversial topic. No. You thought that the last one where we talked about ritual and liturgy, thought that was controversial? Well, wait for this one. Talking about infant baptism today, infant baptism. And for some of you who are hearing this or watching this, you're thinking, I'm already not going to listen to these guys anymore. <laughs> so we, um, uh, we are here to talk about infant baptism and why um, uh, infant baptism is biblical. Yes, biblical. And i uh, going to be inviting Brandon to give us quite a bit of um, his own story on this one, because as you'll hear quite soon, his is a very interesting story uh, as we begin to think about this topic. So, Brandon, why might I be asking you to uh, talk about the topic of infant baptism? Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, um, so I uh, grew up actually in a Roman Catholic um, setting. Um, I was baptized into the Roman Catholic Church and, and uh, did, you know, First Communion and Confirmation and all, all of that sort of thing. In my 20s, I really started thinking more deeply about the faith. I was reading the Bible for the first time in my life. I was um, serving in the, in the Navy at the time. And uh, my wife and I started going to different churches. We have different backgrounds. My background was Roman Catholicism. Her background was more of the Restorationist background. And so we started just going to a different denomination every single Sunday. And just a combination of, of kind of church hunting and reading the Bible and trying to navigate you know, these things for you know, really the first time in, in my life anyway. Um, we came upon a Baptist church, and um, we, we, we joined the Baptist church, and um, the arguments for believer's baptism uh, seemed to make sense at the time. So I was re-baptized in this Baptist church. I had been baptized in a Roman Catholic church, and um, I was baptized uh, again at, at a Baptist church because the baptism that I received was um, not by immersion uh, in, in the, in the, Catholic, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and I wasn't a believer at the time. And so that was kind of a, a, big, a big bugaboo in the, in the Baptist world, because Baptists would say, as, as many um, evangelicals would say, that baptism is the immersion of a believer in water. You don't have immersion, you don't have a believer, you don't have baptism. Um, and those were my convictions for, I guess, maybe 11 years or more. Um, as I um, was a Baptist, uh, went to a Baptist Bible college. Um, I was serving as a senior pastor at a Baptist church. And um, so that was very much my kind of ingrained convictions um, that the New Covenant was a believer's only covenant. To be in the, in the New Covenant, you had to be a believer in Christ, born again. And those are the people that you baptize by full immersion in water upon their profession of faith. Um, but I also started encountering um, the, the Reformed view of baptism. And, and that my, my journey started really when I was in Bible college. I started um, wrestling with the, um, the Reformed and Presbyterian understanding of baptism. And um, one of the places that I was uh, reading from in, in those early years was the Heidelberg Catechism. And I thought I would uh, just read it. It's pretty short, but it's, it, it gets right to the point, I think, of, um, of how Reformed Presbyterians typically think about um, infant baptism. Uh, question 74 of the Heidelberg says, Should infants also be baptized? Yes. Infants, as well as, as well as adults, are included in God's covenant and people. They, no less than adults, are promised deliverance from sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who works faith. Therefore, by baptism... The sign of the covenant, they too should be incorporated into the Christian church and distinguished from children of unbelievers 
This is was done in the Old Testament by circumcision, which was replaced in the New Testament by baptism. Um, so, <clears throat> I was starting to encounter that view in in Bible college. I went off to seminary and went to an actually I went to a, a Reformed Presbyterian seminary where I, I saw that view a lot. I was serving actually at the time in a Presbyterian church where I got to witness it um, um, throughout the uh, the years, and so. I started wrestling, is that really biblical? Is that biblical? Is their understanding, is this reformed understanding of baptism, that that is not only infant baptism, but also believer's baptism? Um, because if an adult um, uh, comes to faith in, in, in Christ, they will, will be baptized. Um, so it's, it's not, not as though Presbyterians and Reformed are against believer's baptism. They do believer's baptism. But... They also baptize the children of believers. So I started wrestling with that. You know, is, is that what the Bible is pointing us to? And I came to the convictions um, while I was serving as a senior pastor uh, of, of a Baptist church that, in fact, that is what the Bible is teaching us. Um, that, that is, in fact, what the Bible has in view, that our children should receive the covenant sign of baptism. Um, if you want to hear more about that, I spoke about that at our uh, Reformation conference we did at Westside. You can find that at uh, westsidereform.org. Uh, the talk should be there. Um, and I came across, you know, as I was, you know, you know, wondering, is this is this biblical? I came across B.B. Uh, Warfield, and I'll just go ahead and read you the quote that uh, that he said, and I think it kind of summarizes the essence of the argument. Uh, he said, God established his church in the days of Abraham, and he put children into it. They must remain there until he puts them out. He has nowhere put them out. They are still members of his church, and as such, entitled to its ordinances. So what B.B. Warfield is pinpointing is that there is a covenantal unity to the Bible. The covenant of grace beginning in Genesis 3.15, really, with God's promise to, to, to Adam that um, through the seed of the woman would come one to crush the head of the serpent. Um, you have kicking off there the covenant of grace that um, extends to us today in the covenant of grace. Um, um, the covenant of Abraham is part of the covenant of grace all the way up to the new um, covenant in Christ. And Really, the new covenant in Christ is a fulfillment of, of, of what was uh, promised and pointed to and spoken about in the Abrahamic um, covenant. And so there is a covenantal unity to the entire Bible. And when we look at the, at the Bible, when we look specifically at Abraham and, and, and uh, thereafter in Israel, we see children were part of the covenantal community. Children were part of God's people. Uh, children received the sign of the covenant. What was the sign? It was circumcision. That was the, uh, the sacrament, if you like, of, of the Old Testament saints. And as the Catechism mentioned, baptism replaces circumcision. That was an Old Testament reality, and it has been replaced by baptism. Um, why, why did the Heidelberg Catechism say that? Um, well, Colossians 2, verse 11 and 12, they speak about how circumcision was... Um, replaced by baptism in the new covenant. And so if children were circumcised in the old covenant, it makes sense then, does it not, that they would then be baptized in the new covenant? Um, uh, one of the things that I had to wrestle with as a Baptist was, were the children kicked out of the covenant? For thousands of years, the children were part of God's covenant people. They were part of God's covenant community. And when we come into the New Testament, were they excommunicated? When Pentecost happened, was Pentecost an excommunication ceremony for children? Among, among other things, but were, were children kicked out? And I had to wrestle with that. And, and, and that was something that really kind of stung as I was even my early years in Bible college wrestling with this idea of why are the children now excluded? The new covenant is this bigger covenant. 
it's going all around the world. The Holy Spirit's, you know, it's it, it's just this massive, bigger, awesome covenant. And, but how come it shrunk? How come a lot of its members were then just kicked out? Why were the children of believers who have always been covenant members, who have always received the sign of the covenant, <clears throat> why are they now kicked out, excluded from the covenant, from the sacraments? Uh, what what happened? I didn't quite understand what the the sign of circumcision was to an Old Testament person. I I don't think that I grasped that quite. Um, but it's right there, I think, in Romans 4.11. Romans 4.11 talks about Abraham. What was the cutting off of the flesh to Abraham? Was it a mere ethnic, national badge or something? Was it, was it something that just pertained to the nation of Israel and, and, and where they are and creating boundaries? I, I don't think so. In fact, Romans 4.11 says that it was speaking about inward realities. It was speaking about the righteousness that Abraham had by faith, by faith. And then he was to give that sign then to his children uh, and because they were part of the covenantal community. And so again, if children of believers receive the covenant sign under Abraham, should they receive it today? Should they receive it uh, in our churches t today? Um I started reading through the New Testament, just kind of wrestling with some of the passages um, that speak about baptism, that speak about um, children. And one of the things that um, I started really seeing was that the Bible, specifically the New Testament, presupposes that children of believers are still part of God's covenant people. The Bible presupposes that children are still there. They were not excommunicated at Pentecost, um, but they are still part of God's covenant of grace. Just as they were in the days of Abraham, so too are they today. Um, a couple places where we see this, I think, is one is in Luke chapter 18, where parents are bringing their babies to, to, to Jesus, and Jesus says, let the children come to me. Because the disciples, you know, were trying to keep, keep the, the children, the babies, the moms bringing their babies, trying to keep, keep them away, saying, no, you know, the, the Savior doesn't have time for that. And Jesus was saying, no, let the children come to me, for such belongs the kingdom of God. What's interesting is that the children were not necessarily, you know, walking to him. They were being carried. They were babies. They were being carried by their mothers and parents to, to Christ to, to be blessed. Um, so we see, I think, the, the heart of Jesus there in, in receiving um, the, the children. The Apostle Paul, in, in his letters, he, he approaches children like they're part of the covenant. He uses covenantal language when he's talking and addressing children. For example, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, um, the Apostle Paul tells children to obey in the Lord. And, and that's a covenantal phrase. That's a covenantal way of talking to children. Obey in the Lord. And then what does Paul say? Well, Paul is rooting this in the fifth commandment, to obey your mother and father, for it is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you in the land. Well, so the Apostle Paul is talking to children of believers and saying, Obey in the Lord, so it will go well with you in the land. Uh, what land is he talking about? He's not talking about that the children in Ephesus are going to Israel. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. He's talking eschatologically. And um, we see the same kind of thing in Colossians 3, uh, 3.20, where he says that the obedience of children is pleasing to God. Their obedience is pleasing to him. In 1 Corinthians 7.14, the Apostle Paul says that children are holy, by virtue of being a child of one believing parent, if at least if at least one of the parents is a believer, um, your children are holy, he says. So that shows that there is a distinction still being made between children of unbelievers and children of believers. Children of believers um, have a kind of a uh, have been kind of set apart, as it were, um, and I think the Apostle Paul just presupposes that.
In Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, Peter is telling people to respond to his message by getting baptized, and then he tells them this promise is for you and your children. How would um, Jewish people who are converting to Christianity, how would they have understood Peter when he says this promise is for you and your children? They, he, they would have understood it in an Abrahamic way, that children are still part of the covenant community, and they're going to get the covenant sign of baptism. Um, well, people say, I, we don't see an, an example of that. We don't see an example of an infant, a baby, being baptized. Um, or do we? Uh, you know, as I was reading the Bible, uh, especially the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you see household baptisms. Um, household baptisms are not something that's kind of, um, you know, done only a couple times. It's actually over and over and over you see um, household baptisms are actually kind of the norm. That's right. It's something that is pretty normative for the church. And even before I was wrestling with all of these issues of baptism, I was talking with a fellow Baptist pastor friend of mine, and I was reading through Acts, reading through 1 Corinthians, and you know, Paul will talk about, I baptized that household, or I baptized that household. And I was talking to my Baptist pastor friend, and I said, we don't ever talk like that. I never say, I baptize that household, that household. That's not normative for me. That doesn't make any sense in a Baptist world for me, unless I knew you for 30 years and I just so happened to see your kids grow up and make professions of faith and I baptize the whole house. But it, it, it just does not um, fit the Baptistic paradigm of believers only baptism. And it seems that whole households were getting baptized. You would have mom or dad would come to faith in Christ, and uh, their whole household would then be baptized in Christ. And so starting to see that as more normative, and I um, started to um, rethink um, my believers only baptism. And again, and again the Re Reformed Presbyterian believe in believer baptism. It's the only part that they don't believe in. And I started to think they were right about that. They were right not to believe in the believer's only part of baptism, um, but it's believers and their children after them. And I will say, you know, you 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 look at I I look at my children in kind of a different light. I mean, when I was coming into more reformed convictions, starting to kind of see, oh, my children are part of the covenant. Um, it's not something that I'm hoping one day, you know, they'll profess a faith and one day they'll be a member of the covenant. But right now they're just completely gone. They're completely out. And I've just got to constantly, you know, I don't know, really press and press and try to get them in. Now, of course, I, would, I you know, I still exhort my children to respond and believe and, 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 and all of these things. But it was different in, in, in coming and looking at my children and saying, you're part of God's covenant community right now. God's promise uh, rests upon you. And it re kind of recalibrated me as a parent and as a, how I looked at my children. Um, Zach, do you have anything you want to add or anything? Yeah, sure. I think maybe on that vein that you're just mentioning, there is a real, I think, clarity that occurs, a helpful clarity when you begin to view your children as part of the church, part of the covenant people, uh, members of God's people, because before you get to that point, I think that most Baptistic parents are confused about what to do and think about their children. I think that, you know, God forbid if a child dies early before making that public profession of faith and being immersed in water, there's this level of anxiety and fear that can occur and people can create new categories like an age of accountability, which isn't really found in the Bible anywhere. But certain things to try to make themselves feel better. Uh, still, when Baptistic parents have children, they do treat them differently. They sometimes dedicate them in the worship service. Uh, that's, that's unique. I think they often teach their children to pray even before they're baptized, 
And I'm not sure how you can call God your father if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. But still, I think Baptistic parents are a glorious inconsistency on this. Glorious. <laughs> I'm glad for it. But the to recognize that, no, your, your gut feeling is correct on this. That there is something distinctly um, holy about your children. Your children are not like the children of the world. That's why you can teach them to pray to the Father in the name of the Son. That's why you can exhort them to um, honor uh, God uh, in Christ, as Brandon was reading from Ephesians uh, 6, in the Lord. And this is why we can you know, give them every assurance as they grow up. Not to treat them like, I've heard the phrase, vipers and diapers yeah. before. Not to treat them like that, but to treat them as holy to the Lord. And I think that just gives a lot of clarity to the Christian parent who knows just deep down there's something different about my children than the children of the world. And the, the thing that um, clarifies that for us is the grace of God in his covenants. And just to mention a little bit more about what Brandon was saying, if you think about covenants in the Bible... Covenants always include offspring. You go back into the Garden of Eden and mm -hmm. God entered into um, a relationship with Adam. But it wasn't just Adam as an individual. It was his offspring. That's why we find ourselves in a fallen world today. You see yourself the covenant of common grace with Noah. And that covenant did not just include Noah, but all the generations after Noah. As you look at the rainbow and we see the rainbow in the sky. We see, obviously, Abraham, as Brandon mentioned. We see Moses. We see um, the Davidic covenant. Well, with David include his offspring. Uh, covenants include offspring in the Bible. So it's strange to me that we would then have this view of the new covenant, where all of a sudden, this brand new covenant does not include anyone except the individual. Well, and what's interesting, too, is, is when you read about new covenant promises in the old covenant, for example... Um, uh, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah 33, we see different um, promises pointing to the new covenant. And in Jeremiah 32, when it's talking about this coming new covenant, it says it's for you and your offspring included right in yeah. the new covenant. But then we say, yeah. Yeah. No, I... Many promises of the Messiah are made to the house of Israel or to the house of Judah. And if it's a promise of the Messiah made to the house of Israel, the house of Judah, clearly that doesn't just include the parents. That includes all of the house. Right. And Christ is being promised to them as well in those moments. So, you know, I, I think that, I, I hope that that would help to give comfort to Christian parents who do know there's something different about their children. And to give them a sense, a sense of consistency then. Yeah. And how we raise them and, and teach them. Like Brandon said, I want to just reiterate this, that we, we still tell our children all the time, believe in Jesus and repent of your sins. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing I tell myself. It's the same thing I tell our congregation. Believe in Jesus today. Repent of your sins today. We must always do this, continue to cling to Jesus Christ by faith. And it's that sort of spirit that we want to convey to our children, not a sense of fear like they're outside of Christ and they need to come to him for the first time. But rather, no, you're in Christ. Trust in him. Rest in him. Receive his promises. So, Zach, what would you say to mom or dad? They're, they're hearing this. They're saying, okay, I, I can see that. I can see that you know, maybe my, my infant is part of God's covenant community. But the, the word for baptize is baptizo, and it means to immerse. And so... Um, you're sprinkling babies. How do we understand all of that? Sure. Yeah, great question. The uh, term baptizo uh, does oftentimes mean immersion, yes. But it can also mean just simply washing. Maybe a broader understanding of what the term uh, refers to. There were washings of couches and various other kinds of um, utensils that are noted in the New Testament. And I really don't think that they were immersing like as a death and burial, resurrection kind of right. action with these uh, utensils, items of furniture, or washing of hands and so forth. It, it's just not um, required by the language. The idea of dip uh, is uh, um, understood with bapto, which is an older Greek term that was the predecessor to baptizo. But baptizo, by the time it came to into use 
during the time of the New Testament was much more of a broad term that would mean to, to wash. And so, you know, we can um, uh, notice, we can note that uh, within the Reformed and Presbyterian Church that different modes of baptism are fine. It's washing that's important, whether it's a sprinkling or a pouring or uh, we've had members received into our church who were immersed in the past and were perfectly happy with that. So the, it's the application of water, the washing with water, that is of significance. Yeah, Any and thoughts you have on that? I was going to say that's a good point. You know, when you look at how the Bible describes baptism and, and what it symbolizes, yes, death, burial, and resurrection um, is one of the kind of symbolisms behind mm -hmm. baptism. But really, the majority, the majority, as you kind of exhaust the the Bible, the majority um, of the of the imagery is washing, a cleansing, um, and that's conveyed well in pouring. That's conveyed well in sprinkling. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a full blown immersion where you make sure every limb and every body part is under under the water. Uh, but it can be a washing, a cleansing, a a, a sprinkling. Um, so, yeah, all modes, I think, are, are valid modes, for sure. Um, anybody who's kind of wrestling with this and wants some more information, there's a, a helpful book. It's called Jesus Loves the Little Children, Why We Baptize Children by Daniel Hyde. Um, just a great short kind of a introductory book, really, on uh, the whole issue if you're wanting to kind of grapple more um, about that. Um, but... Uh, thanks for, for joining us today. The Cincy Reformers podcast is a podcast of Westside Reform Church. You can visit us at westsidereform.org and visit us on Sundays at 10 a.m. Have a blessed day.